Well, good morning. Uh, it's good to be together this morning to worship and to remember the Lord Jesus Christ and also to learn as we look at God's word together. We're going to start this morning simply by doing that with two songs of praise. Uh, Lord, I come before your throne of grace and, uh, and then the hymn, how, how Great Thou Art. Both of these songs remind us something of the character of God. Uh, and then a little later this morning, um, I've asked Alice to lead us in prayer to pray for our world because I'm sure you've been greatly affected by our fellow people, human beings in Turkey and Syria. And I think it's just good this morning to spend time in prayer as, as some are maybe still buried, still waiting and to join them in prayer this morning in the extremity of their circumstance. Uh, and then Hadi's going to help us as we come to communion and remembering what Christ has done for us and the extent that he went to uh, for us as humanity and as individual people. Uh, and then we'll turn to God's word in Matthew. as we are in really the brokenness of that world and as this hymn goes on to reflect God stepping into our world and doing what he had to do in order to give us a foundation to live once again. So let's uh, join in this song. Lord my God, Some of the challenges of our world and maybe of your life too because i don't know what your life has been like this week and our lives have certainly been dominated by the day by day by day hour by hour uh, and sometimes person by person 
stories that have been coming out of Turkey uh, and Syria layered onto uh, the war, the, the ongoing fighting that's been going on in Syria, the, the whole tension as to who owns what part of land between Syria, Turkey, Syria and other nations too. Uh, that's without even mentioning other parts of the world. And I thought it would be good this morning to enter into prayer uh, for people that we don't even know, uh, people that we will never met, and some who have already passed. I've had a strong sense over this week that, that God is present with every human being in that moment of leaving this world. I believe in the graciousness, kindness, patience of God to the, to the very end. And you and I have no idea the thousands 20 odd thousand, 28,000, it's got to climb. We, we realize that there are many, many people missing. They haven't even put a number, I don't think, on the missing. I may be wrong there, but I don't think they have. And so the, the, the thought that, that God has been present with everyone who has been lost and that God is present with those who are still trapped. Uh, and we, while you and I have the responsibility as followers of Jesus to communicate the message of Jesus, God, by his spirit, continues to strive with every human being and is present with them. And I just thought it would be good this morning to spend moments in thought and in prayer, specifically for those who are still alive, for those who are trying uh, to get to them. And that, that, that there will be more miracles of physical preservation but let's pray, too, that there will be and have been many miracles of spiritual salvation, even in those moments of death, which many have experienced. So there's a hymn I thought we would sing. I will sing that hymn, uh, I Cannot Tell. Uh, and then Alice is going to lead us in prayer. And so through the singing of this hymn, in moments of quiet, and then as Alice prays for our world with some of those things in mind, uh, let's join in prayer. There, there are so many things or recognizing that there's, we know what God is trying to do. We know that Christ has come and done a crucial thing, which we'll reflect on in communion in a moment. Uh, and we also know that Christ is coming back, which is what our last hymn talked about, that when Christ returns. But how is God going to sort all this out? The horror of our world in many senses, the wonder and beauty of our world, but also the horror of our world. We have many questions. I cannot tell how it's going to work out, but this I know. This I know that there is Christ, that God is at work in Christ. So if you're able to stand with us to just say. I cannot tell.
pray. Hallelujah. Almighty Father, in the name of Jesus, our God, our Lord, our Master, we come to you this morning, O God, with thanksgiving in our hearts, O Lord, for the privilege that you brought us here, safe and sound is in this sanctuary. Thank you, Almighty God, for the life that you have given us. Thank you for the salvation. Thank you, Lord God, for the peace that passes understanding that you've given to each and every one of us. As we come to you this morning, O God, to pray, Lord, our brethren, to pray, Lord God, ourselves, and to pray, Lord God, the whole world, we are asking to you to forgive our sins. So that, Father, whatever we utter this morning in prayer, O oh God, you can hear into the throne of grace. So, so, Father in heaven, thank you so much for this wonderful moment that you have given to your people to pray, Lord God, first and foremost, O oh Lord, ourselves, that you will continue, Lord God, to restore our strength. So that, Father, we can do whatever you want us to do while we are here on earth, Lord God, especially for the sharing of your words to the people, especially those people who didn't know you yet. So, Father, give us that courage. Give us, us that um, uh, boldness, Lord God, to spread the gospel to the unbelievers, Lord. Hallelujah. Because there are a lot of signs, Lord God, that we can see. You are coming soon, Lord God. Lord, in, in heaven, oh God, we bow down our hearts this morning. We pray, Lord God, that you will continue, Lord, give, oh God, especially those people in Turkey, Lord God, in Syria, that they are suffering from this natural calamity, Lord. No one can control this father except you. So, Father, we pray that you will continue, Lord God, to comfort the hearts of those people who lost their loved ones, lost their families, Lord God. We pray that you will continue to encourage them, comfort them, and especially those brethren who are there, Lord God. Remind them, Lord God, that you are the God who knows everything, and you are the God who loves them, Lord. So, Father, we pray for the brethren who are there, in, in Serbia, in Turkey, Lord God, or uh, all over the world, Lord God, that we feel this courage because of what's happening in this world, Lord. We pray for your encouragement, oh God, that they will focus on you. They will fix on I their eyes to you, Lord God, for you are the author and the perfecter of our faith. So, Father, thank you for this wonderful moment, oh God, that we are, we are here as a church play, uh, praying and pleading unto thy, thy grace, Lord God, your greatness, Lord, to these people, to these brethren who are affected for this natural calamity. So, Father in heaven, give them peace, give them love, Lord God, and encourage them to find Fight the good fight of faith because we knew Lord God that even you you suffered before so father we will not uh, surrender Lord whatever happenings to us oh God because it is your plan for us to give us a good future so father we thank you for this uh, this opportunity that we can pray for them give them Lord God hallelujah Lord, their focus unto you and give them, Lord God, the opportunity that they can see your plan in their lives, Lord, even though they encountered a lot of, of, of trials and uh, tribulation in life, oh God. We pray for peace, oh God, and even, Lord God, supply the needs of all the people around there and encourage, oh God, remind, oh God, the government and all the people who are who, who are helping them, we pray, Lord God, that they will not, Lord, surrender and they will not, Lord, stop helping these people who are in needs, Father. We love you, Lord. We bring you back all the praises, the glory, the honor, the thanksgiving belongs to you alone. In Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Master, we bow down to you. Amen. Um. I was struck this week, I had, so I get news from Ukraine and the support of Ukraine. Sometimes I've copied it around the church and I maybe will copy this one letter around, but I was struck by um, a Bible school that we work with, which has really become a refugee center on the border of Romania, Ukraine and Moldova, how uh, 
within hours of hearing about the earthquake, they already had a convoy of vehicles going into Ukraine full of aid that they simply switched the direction of the convoy uh, to Turkey. Uh, and it just the thought of the Ukrainian brothers and sisters with Romanian uh, switching neat stuff that is in one sense needed in Ukraine, but recognizing the devastation in the other direction and, and, and heading instead of Ukraine, heading uh, down towards Turkey. And, and uh, we have a number of brothers and sisters that we know uh, uh, through Echoes International. Um, Amanda Berger, uh, you may have picked up Echoes International is a mission agency we connect with. And uh, those who are working in and out of Turkey, um, a Christian couple uh, was killed. Uh, their children survived. Uh, it was just one Christian family. There are so few, in a sense, uh, committed Christian families in that part of the world. So to lose, as it were, one couple, but it was just a reminder of our brothers and sisters who are there in the middle of all this. There may not be many, but that God may uh, really help them. So if you want to know, uh, maybe we'll circulate that newsletter on the WhatsApp group that you can just be connected. There's so many connections we have as a church. Sometimes we forget to share across the church so that we can understand uh, what's ways that we can help. And it also raises, if, if you feel burdened to give financially, or maybe you have through the through the broader aid agencies, and that is fine, but there is ways as a church, through Echoes International, we could uh, pass money directly that would go through the connections we have into these places. So if you want to think about that as part of not just general giving, which is one aspect, uh, but a specific extra giving towards situations like this. So if, if you have a burden to help and you're not quite sure how to do it, then come and speak to the leadership team because we do have some direct routes uh, to pass aid on into these situations. Honey, would you lead us as we come to communion? Thanks. Saying. Um, we thank the Lord uh, that every time we come to church, uh, God is giving us the opportunity to come into the Lord's table. But for some, um, maybe uh, because we do it every Sunday, it may be uh, for some, uh, could be a meaningless ritual. But it is our prayer that as we um, um, join the uh, communion uh, service, uh, let it be our prayer that it would be an intimate time for us to spend time with uh, the Lord Jesus Christ by the power of uh, the Holy Spirit. And so uh, this um, morning, uh, I want us to reflect on the scenario um, where uh, Cleopas and uh, his other companion, uh, as they walked back uh, uh, to uh, Emmaus, uh, as they were having conversation about the uh, tragedy that happened uh, during the um, resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, it's based in the book of uh, Luke, uh, chapter 24, uh, verses 13, uh, 31, but I'm not going to read that whole uh, chapter. Uh, I'm just going to read uh, the verses from uh, Luke 24, uh, verses um, 30, 30 to uh, 32. It says uh, in Luke uh, chapter 24, verses 30 to 32, when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. As we know the um, sequence uh, on uh, the resurrection, before uh, the resurrection day, we know that um, Jesus was the uh, feet of his disciples then he ate his uh, last Passover meal, and then he was arrested, he was crucified, and died on the cross. And so the Sunday morning, there were some women who came to uh, visit the tomb and uh, to see Jesus, and then they found out that Jesus' body was not there. And so they, uh, these women seen that Jesus was alive, and so these women um, break the news and so uh, that Jesus was alive. And so uh, Cleopas, on his way back to Emos, uh, together with the other companion, um, they, were, um, they were talking about this tragedy that happens. 
And so there was a strange man who appeared to be Jesus Christ. And um, he explained to them that that happened so that the fulfillment of uh, the prophecy in the scriptures. But uh, they didn't recognize that it was Jesus. But in, in verse 30, uh, in verse 31, it says, then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. So the first thing that Jesus did is to open their eyes uh, from what the scripture was saying. But then uh, when we read in, in verse uh, 30, it says, in verse 30, it says, um, when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it and began to give it to, to, to them. And then in verse 31, it says, then their eyes were open and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. And so it was when Jesus broke the bread and gave it thanks to them. It was when, uh, when the communion, it was when, when Cleopas recognized that it was Jesus. And so it similarly in our lives, as we may have that uh, spirit of fear, we may have that spirit of uh, anxieties and doubts. Uh, uh, we may have that spirit of, um, uh, we may have struggles uh, to uh, believe in the scriptures. But as we take the communion service this morning, as we, take, as we partake of the bread and wine, let it be our prayer that God will touch our hearts and that we would have an intimate, uh, uh, an intimate express, uh, experience in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So the, the, the elements, as we pray for the elements, the bread and the wine, let it be our prayer that God will allow us to open our spiritual eyes, our spiritual understanding, so that we may be refocused once again, we may fix our eyes again unto Jesus. Last Friday, as we uh, have our Bible study, one word that I still cuts my, uh, that still uh, cuts my, my my heart is the word um, uh, is we, we fall away is falling away from uh, from uh, our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and so let it be our let it be our prayer as we take the bread and the wine that us uh, let it be our prayer that we may be refocused uh, to uh, the salvation uh, that what what God has Jesus done for us in the cross of Calvary Amen Amen Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we leave up to you, Lord, these elements as you take up, uh, as you partake of the bread, O oh Lord, that symbolizes the wounds, O oh Lord, that you suffer from the cross. We thank you, Father, that because of your wounds, O oh God, Lord, there is healing. And it's our prayer, Father, that heal us, O oh God, from the inside out. And even as we take, O oh Lord, this juice, Father, that represents, O oh Lord, your blood that was shed on the cross. We thank you, Father, that there is, Lord, forgiveness, that because there is power in your blood, we receive forgiveness. And you give us, O oh Lord, uh, liberty, O oh Father, freedom from the slavery of sin. And so, Father, we thank you. We bless you, O oh God, and allow us, Father, once again, to refocus, O oh God, to fix our eyes unto you, that what you have done on the cross, O oh Lord, and the Calvary, Help us, O oh Father God, to get closer to you, to draw closer to you, Father God, for that is your desire for us to have a closer and deeper relationship with you. Because it is you who first love us, not that we love you, but that you have loved us, not that we chose you, Lord, but, but it is you who have chosen us. And so, Lord, we thank you and we give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here is love, fast as the ocean, love it kindness as the flood, where the bliss of life are ransomed, shed for us his precious blood.
Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 17 through to 20. The fulfillment of the law. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. We've been reading through the book of Matthew and we have arrived at chapter 5. And uh, we're going to have a little look at uh, what we read in Matthew 5 verse 17. Now actually, if you find in your Bible Matthew chapter 5... We're actually looking at a very long passage this morning, but uh, we're not going to go through it in verse by verse detail. Uh, but we are looking at uh, a significant time when Jesus talks uh, about something that actually um, these things that I'm putting up on screen have in common. What do goats and beans and seeds and clothes and marriages have in common? Um, Particularly those particular pictures, uh, a young goat and its mother and uh, different varieties of seeds that you may plant in the garden or clothing that is made from different fabrics or marriage and sexual behavior. What does all of that have in common? Well, one thing it has in com common is that there are regulations about all these things in the law, in the Mosaic law. In the book of Leviticus, the fact that you're not supposed to use mixed or hybrid seeds in agriculture, which would be quite a problem for modern agriculture, or to cook the meat of a young goat in its mother's milk and not to mix 
textiles in our garments. Now, I suspect if you go around the room here, we're all make, wearing clothing of mixed, <laughs> mixed textiles. Uh, and marriage and sexual morality. These are all things that are addressed by God in the law of Moses. And as we were looking at this passage and reading Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, uh, down to the end of the chapter, then in essence, there are three major things that we're looking at. One is the question of Jesus Christ and the law of Moses. What's the relationship between the Messiah and the law of Moses? So not surprisingly, Jesus was facing many questions uh, from his fellow Jews, who many of them who were devoted to the law, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. While we may criticize them, they had this in common. They were devoted to the keeping of the law, though they had different interpretations as to how you keep it. So the question to this Messiah, Jesus, what's your relationship with the law? Uh, and then, of course, your followers. Now, I've used the term Christian there, but the question of the Christian and the Mosaic law. Uh, and the bottom line is, how do we live a life that truly honors God? And as we'll see, the rest of the chapter covers six illustrations, or Jesus picks on six things to talk about how he interpreted uh, the law of Moses. But back to what we read in chapter 5, verse 17, he starts by saying, don't think that I have come uh, to abolish the law of Moses. This is, in a sense, the whole of the Old Testament. It specifically is the Torah, the five books of the Old Testament, which the Sadducees had a particular commitment to. Or when you think about it, it was all of the traditions that had grown up regarding how you keep the law, the Sabbath, how far you could walk, uh, what you could do on the Sabbath, the sixth day, what was defined as work. Could you switch a light switch on? Is that permitted on the Sabbath or is that causing work to be done? So therefore you can't put the lights on on the Sabbath. You certainly couldn't light a fire or cook food. So you had to cook it and prepare it on the day. All of these were partly written in the five books of Moses and also had grown up as a set of traditions if you want to honor God and please God, you have to do this and don't do that and don't wear these clothes and don't eat these foods and don't go there. And many of us maybe who are brought up in Christian homes were brought up with that kind of thinking that there is a large numbers of laws. So what about Jesus and the law? Well, Jesus says very precisely that he had not come to abolish it that he absolutely was not against the law of Moses. Now, this was pretty important. In fact, we're reminded elsewhere in the New Testament that Jesus was born under the law. He was a Jew, and he therefore committed himself to keeping the covenant as a Jew with God, the covenant that Moses had constituted. But you notice in verse 17, he says very clearly that he hasn't come to abolish it, but he has actually come to do something with the law. What is the word that he uses? It's an interesting word, isn't it? What is it? I've come to fulfill it. It has a sense in which it is about filling it up, just as you fill up a glass of water. There's a sense in which he is, well, another word we could use is to complete it, to fulfill it, not just to fill it up, and not just to illustrate it or to live as a perfect example of the law, but a bit like a jigsaw piece, that, that final piece that completes the picture. So Jesus says here that he has not come to abolish the law, but on the other hand, he has come to complete it, which hints at the fact that maybe it's come to an end. Do you follow that? Because something could be growing and developing for many years, and it's a good thing, but eventually it's completed. And when it's completed, a bit like a jigsaw, actually, what do you do with a jigsaw when you've completed it? Sometimes we put it on a, in a frame and put it on the wall, but often we just put it back in the box, don't we? <laughs> Even throw it away and never look at it again because the, the purpose of the jigsaw was to complete it. And having completed it, its job is done. So when Jesus said, I've not come to abolish the law, I've come to fulfill 
fulfill or completed, he was hinting at something, actually, which as you go on through the New Testament, it, it, we recognize that the law of Moses was something that was given very specifically by God to Israel. Actually, the law wasn't given for all nations to follow. But it was given as part of an agreement, a contract between God and Israel. And therefore, it was very much for a period of time. Now, on screen and on the recording, uh, we'll upload the, the, the slides. There are a number of New Testament verses that you could go and look at. I, I, won't, I put them there because I don't want you thinking I'm making this up um, uh, and this is just my idea. But there are a number of verses. We're not going to look at them uh, together in this session. But I want you to actually go and read them. That you will actually understand that the law of Moses was time limited. It was part, it was a phase in the way that God dealt with the whole human race race by making a covenant with a particular group of people, the Jewish people, the, the nation of Israel. And so actually, the, the Mosaic law had a purpose. It was like a train going down a track. It had an end, a telos. It had a, a destination. And actually, that destination was Jesus Christ. And, and so Jesus, when he says, I've not come to destroy it, but to fulfill it, he knew that he was going to be the final jigsaw piece. And that when he was put in there, that actually the law of Moses itself would be laid aside. Now, on Friday, Sean asked me to give a mention to the Friday class. So here we go. Not just in the notices, but in the middle of the message. The Friday Bible study group is, I think, looking at the book of Hebrews. Am I right? Uh, and in the book of Hebrews, we get the actual term that the old covenant is obsolete. Now, that's a pretty strong term, but it's an interesting term, isn't it? If, if, if I, I worked for many years in a part of a world where to have a bicycle was something really great. I mean, normally you walked, but if you saved up enough money, you could have a bicycle. So in Zambia, as we were working around the villages to go by bicycle or motorbike was like a huge step up. But as the economy in Zambia developed, the local teachers in the villages, they didn't just buy a bicycle or a motorbike. It got to the point where they could buy by a car. <laughs> now, when you have a bike and a car uh, and you've suffered cycling um, and you buy a car, then the bike becomes obsolete, isn't it? Now, sometimes the bike could be brand new and perfectly good, but you just didn't use it because you had a, a car. So the idea of obsolete doesn't mean the law was bad. It just means it had served its time. And now you put it on a shelf because it's done its time. You have something better. In fact, the book of Hebrews is all about the fact that what we have in Jesus is better than the covenant of Moses. Uh, and this was dramatically demonstrated, actually, at the point of Christ's crucifixion. Something happened. It was an earthquake, yes. But whether it was the earthquake that caused this or it was a miracle of God, but in the temple, there was a huge thick curtain that divided the most holy place where the, the Ark of the Covenant was, or at least the symbol of God's presence was there. We're never quite sure whether the Ark of the Covenant was in the second temple, but it was certainly the room where God, as it were, lived. That curtain that blocked the way into God's presence was torn from the top to the bottom. And it's a powerful symbol reminding us that something happened in the death and resurrection of Christ that effectively finished the Mosaic law and gave us a new covenant, which, of course, is the terms we use of the cup and the bread. This is the blood of the new covenant. This is the new covenant uh, in my blood. So... When we think about the law, Jesus says, I'm not going to abolish it. I'm going to complete it. In this message, we get a hint of what Christ was going to achieve uh, through his life, death, and resurrection. He uses some fairly strong language, he, or rather, he uses some very creative language because he says, not even at the tiniest bit, now the, a jot and a tittle, as the old version talks about it, um, a jot is an iota, it's actually the smallest Hebrew letter, 
uh, which is almost invisible. You could just about pick it out on screen. It's that tiny little flick is a jot. And the tittle is even smaller. It's the flick. Uh, like some of us, when we do a letter T, we may put a little kind of flick at the end. It's the flick at the end. Uh, and uh, if, if you actually... Actually, it's reasonably clear on screen, but uh, I thought it would be too small. If you've got good eyesight, you can tell the difference between some Hebrew letters. And the difference is a tiny extension of a line beyond another line. And that's, that's, that's a tittle. It's just almost invisible. And Jesus is saying, even down to the very smallest flick of a pen, uh, the, the law is going to be completed and fulfilled so in essence he was saying i am not at all playing down the law of moses and in a moment as we carry on reading through this chapter we realize he doesn't just play it down he actually deepens it he makes it even more challenging than the words written in the mosaic law but we see the importance here that we shouldn't despise the Old Testament and the laws of Moses, because all of it was going to be completed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it was, and this is where I'm going to give you some passages to look at. Uh, we've talked about it before. Some of this, Zaki talked about a few weeks ago when we talked about Christ as our priest. But Jesus fulfilled the law, obviously, in what he did. No one could hold anything against Jesus regarding moral behavior. They would have done it. You can be sure of that because they were, there were whole religious parties desperate to bring him down. And if they could have found some sleaze, some vice, you know what it's like with our politicians or anyone who puts themselves forward into public office is going to be scrutinized. You'd almost be terrified to become an MP because you know that everything you've said and done, somebody is going to look through it <laughs> and see what they can find. They found nothing in Jesus, not just his life, but also his teachings, as we're seeing here. So I won't say much more here. His teachings showed that he believed in what God had revealed through the Mosaic law. And some of his famous sayings, and we'll come across one in Matthew 7, do to others as you would have them do to you. Uh, his other ones, his reinforcing of, of love the loving God and loving neighbor as yourself, the whole law and prophets hang on the love for God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. So both in his life and in what he taught, he clearly taught us to follow the commandments. He did not abolish the law, and he did not despise it. But also, and that's what Zaki talked about just before Christmas, actually, when we thought about Jesus as our great high priest. And in the Friday study in the book of Hebrews, you'll certainly see it, how Jesus became our sacrifice. So he took his sin, our sin, on himself. He was baptized, actually, to demonstrate that. And then he actually offers his life as a sacrifice to God as a great high priest. Uh, and, and in that way, he was the final jigsaw piece because the animals couldn't do it. The blood of bulls and goats and all of the rest were merely mirrors reflecting something. But now the something has come and the something is Jesus. And so through his death and resurrection, Jesus completed the law. He absolutely did what the law really was trying to point us to. And so in Jesus Christ, he fulfilled and completed the law. And so we realize that it is important to respect the law of Moses and not to play it down, because actually it's something that Christ was to complete. And so it's an important part of the process, but also because within the Mosaic law, and this is the thing we started with, with those pictures, within the Mosaic law, there are things that reveal God's character and nature, which remain valid for us to reflect on today. So some people have divided up the Mosaic law into things like ceremony or civil or contemporary aspects to do with food and hygiene and sickness. And there are a lot of regulations in the Mosaic law about how you treat skin disease, for example. 
there are many things about agriculture, about cooking, about care for animals, which is why you don't disrespect, as it were, the animals to cook uh, the young animal in the milk of the mother. It's, it's maybe to do with disrespecting. I don't know, maybe hygiene rules. There are other aspects of the law that were ceremonial, and they had to do with, as we've said, the understanding of priesthood and sacrifice, which Christ fulfilled. And then there were, well, the predictive sense, the way in which the law was very much telling us about Jesus. But the point I'm getting to is that was very much part of the agreement between God and Israel. But there were other aspects to the law, and you would say the Ten Commandments certainly contain nine, <laughs> nine of them, um, nine ideas that actually are to do with God's character. So they were doctrinal teaching, and then we say ethical precepts. So definitely the Mosaic law taught people to love their neighbors as themselves. Definitely the Mosaic law saw do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not lie, do not steal. Those things are not obsolete. You get what I'm saying? That there's a sense in which the section of the law that is obsolete had to do with the particular details of God and Israel. But within that law, it was based on the character and nature of God, which is unchanging. And therefore, we're not surprised that many things within that law is, is laid at our feet as things that we too need to think about and not think about merely, but to obey. Obedience is how you show that you believe. That's what the kids' song talked about. And whilst Christ, in a sense, fulfilled and completed the law, and you may think, great, we can lay it down, and all we've got to do now is just love each other. We don't have to worry about the details. We do need to worry about the details. Because that reflects the nature and character of God, which is unchanging. So what I wanted us to do very quickly is to read the rest of the chapter. Not going to talk a lot about it. It's not possible. Just to read it and to reflect on this wonderful truth that on one hand, Christ has died through his death and resurrection. In, in a sense, my account with God is clear and I have fulfilled the law in Jesus. But Jesus is calling us to deeper discipleship. In following Jesus, we need to think about, well, how, how do we behave? How do we live? So let's just read it. Verse 21. You have heard it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with their brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Anyone who says to a brother, sister, raka, which is a, a term for despising someone, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you're still together on the way. Your adversary may hand you over to the judge and the judge may hand you over to the officer, the court officer, and you may be thrown into prison Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you've paid the last penny. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. So you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. Mosaic law statements. But Jesus actually deepens the challenge. I say to you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. So on one hand, <clears throat> Jesus is affirming the statements that are found in the Mosaic law, particularly drawing from the commandments. But on the other, he's actually doing what he said in verse 
uh, verse 24, I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the, heaven, the kingdom of heaven. Is actually digging down under the Mosaic law and helping us to see the tick box living, I have kept the commandments, without understanding what the commandments were actually trying to do, will not lead us into a good relationship with God in our living as disciples. Wrong actions come from wrong thoughts and attitudes. And so you notice how he digs under the action of murder to anger and disrespect. We know this now. Surely we understand that it's what we think will eventually come out in our actions. That's why the, the lustfully looking at a, a member of the opposite sex, or men perhaps particularly prone at, at women, it is actually the, the, the lustful thought in my heart that leads to adultery. Adultery doesn't just happen. It is a consequence of a sequence of thoughts beginning with my heart being in the wrong place. So also, and this is something to really think about, Every day, three women are killed by a man in the UK. It's, it's a stunning statistic. Every three days, sorry, every three days, a woman is killed by a man in the UK. This is not the USA. This is not South Africa. This is not parts of the world with high and huge murder rates. This is Britain. Every three days. Over the last 10 years in UK, an average of 77 women have been killed by their partner or ex-partner. That's in UK. That means more than one a week. Now, many of you are women in here and you, you understand this. I'm speaking to myself because sometimes I don't get this, but I realize actually it is in me. Domestic violence... And the whole connection between your thinking, your attitude of disrespect and anger that gets out of control. You know, something that stuck in my head, my father, I can't remember if it was my father or my mother, they said, never talk to someone with a knife in your hand. This is talking about preparing food in the kitchen. You're just preparing food in the kitchen. If somebody comes into the kitchen to talk to you, put the knife down, never talk to someone with a, a dangerous weapon in your hands. Why? Because anger can stir you up and you can lash out at someone. And if you've got something in your hand, you'll use it. So a simple little thing that stuck in my head all my life is recognizing, as Jesus recognized here, it is the thoughts that need to be dealt with because otherwise they will emerge in actions and the actions may be murder or it may be sexual immorality or adultery there's a lot in this passage and i'm going to leave you with some of these thoughts uh by putting the slides up through this week and and uh, on the on the recording and also maybe in our in our life groups too take responsibility for the fact that you may be causing other people to be angry. That's what the bit about going to the altar. If you go to worship God and you remember that somebody has something against you, so I have to recognize that I wind some people up and therefore I need to go to them and apologize so I can lower their anger levels. Are you following that? Think about your effect on other people. And if you're causing them to be angry or agitated, then Jesus says, that, that's unrighteousness. Deal with it, because their anger may lead them to do something to you. Uh, but you are the cause of it, so deal with it. And then, and then those very challenging words about cutting hands off. Jesus spoke like many Jewish people of the day in hyperbole. He absolutely does not mean to mutilate your body. Other scriptures teach us that that is wrong. But he is meaning to deal with evil at source. 
and to recognize if a place you're going to or something you're watching on TV or something you're reading or doing is actually leading your thoughts in the wrong direction, then completely cut it out. It's like with alcohol for some people. Some people cannot touch even a drop. They know that because if they do, there's a, a sequence that will then follow on from what one single act, the, the cutting off of everything that is necessary. Verse 31 to 37, I think, jumps to public life. So I'll leave it with you to think about, because he then talks about if anyone divorces his wife, he must give a certificate of divorce. That's what the law says. But Jesus said, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immor immorality, makes her the victim of adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. And he goes on to say about oath-taking. You've heard it said that do not break your oath, but fulfill your oath to the law. Uh, but then there's this discussion about swearing by heaven or swearing by God or swearing by Jerusalem or swearing by the city of the great king. And I think what Jesus is talking about here is we often justify wrong actions by following the right process. Because that's what he's talking about here. So you think as long as you're careful to write a certificate of divorce, it's okay to divorce. Jesus is saying, no, that's the problem. It's the motivation in your heart to break a covenant in order to enter into a covenant with another woman. So here he's talking about particularly the concept, I will divorce this wife so I can marry another wife. It's about motivation. But as long as I've got the divorce certificate, then I've, then I've ticked the box of the law. It's like swearing. You know that God swears? It says it in the Bible. God swore on an oath to Abraham <laughs> that he would keep his covenant. Jesus swore. That is to say, took an oath when he was arrested. But some of us, we use certain kind of language to cover the fact that we're not trustworthy. And Jesus says, in public life, you need to be trustworthy. So if you say yes, it's yes. If it's no, it's no. Don't add. Don't say in the name of God or in the name of this or the name of that. All you're doing is demonstrating your untrustworthiness. Because if you simply say yes, you should be trusted. It's yes. So in your public life, there should be integrity in everything uh, that you do. And then lastly, the last passage, just a heads up to think about verse 38 to 48. And it is a particularly troubling one. And it draws me back to the song. There was one word or line in that kid's song that I struggled with and I thought, I'm not going to use it. And then I went, I went ahead and used it. Did, did anyone see a, a set of phrases in that song that you really struggled with, that kid's song? Maybe it's too long ago now. Sweetly submitting to authority. <laughs> it was that combination of words, sweetly submitting to authority. And I thought, mm, that, that, there is a problem there because it depends on which authority that you're submitting to. Jesus uh, says, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. This is the problem. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them too. Just give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Jesus addresses a really tricky thing is how do we deal with evil people? How do we deal with those who intend to do us harm in some shape or form. And he actually calls us to a very radical kind of response, which Paul later in the book of Romans develops, and that is responding to evil with good. Responding to evil with good. And it's extremely challenging to do it. I'm sure in life circumstances, you've been in situations where somebody is dealing with you unjustly and they're, they're essentially ripping you off and you have a choice as to how you respond. 
And the response that Jesus is calling us to here is a radical kind of response, a radical kind of love, where you keep expressing goodness towards someone who is committed, as it were, to do evil. Overcoming evil with good. That's what Paul picks up that phrase, overcoming evil with good. And I really want us to think about that this week in some of our life circumstances. It is absolutely not a ban on self-defense because later Jesus tells his disciples to buy some swords for self-defense. It's a tricky passage, but Jesus does say it. And it has a, a distinct meaning. And, and we know that the apostle Paul used the law courts to essentially escape prison because he was being unjustly tried. So this is not a ban on self-defense, nor is it a ban on the legitimate use of law, uh, and nor is it an excuse. I've often been faced with this one um, in certain circumstances. Somebody comes to you and say, can you give me 10 pound? You have to give it to me because Jesus said, give to wh whoever asks. Uh, but no, it's not a ban on the use of discernment in how we respond to people's needs. But it is about radically loving someone who winds you up. And that's what I want us to think about this week. I want us to think about people who really wind us up. Uh, it's that kind of harm. It's not the life death where self-defense rightly kicks in. Uh, or situations where there are laws that protect us and we are right to use the laws to bring protection where that's needed. But people who wind you up, people who make you want to avenge, to get back at them, you know those kind of people? It makes you want to be spiteful back. It makes you want to be nasty back. It makes you want to be less generous. It's those kind of situations where you find yourself on the verge of doing evil back, where Jesus says, no, do good to those who do evil to you. And that's pretty challenging. Time has gone, and we've got plenty to go away and think about, and to allow the word of God to refresh our thinking and refresh our living, because this is what it's about, really, in following Jesus. It's living as Jesus would have us live, so that our lives will be really salty. I'll finish by a connection with last week. Salty lives, that our lives will actually make a difference to those around us. And I think if I could do this, I'm not sure I can. <laughs> I think by God's help, if I could do this, then my life would be kind of salty. It would have a really good effect on those around me. Let me pray, and then we'll close our service. Father, we... Ask for your help as we do this. We realize that this is a huge uh, undertaking and, and some really detailed stuff here uh, and a lot of difficult things to think through. But most of all, we realize we, we must go away in, with a heart to obey, uh, to follow, Lord Jesus, the things that you are teaching us. So help us this week and may our lives really evidently show Christ and a difference in our interactions with people this week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.